Man, we are in Revelation chapter 4. We're going to knock out two chapters today, and uh, I'm going to remind us kind of where we are. And, and so there's a couple of things that are going on here in this book. One, we get a blessing by reading it, and so that's why we're reading a lot of it. Uh, we get a blessing by hearing it read, and so even if you didn't read it, you heard it, there's a blessing. And then there, he says there's a blessing because we heed notice. We take notice of what it says, and we try to implement it and put it into practice in our day-to-day -day life. And so the, that's the blessing written in the book itself. Now, there were three things that he said was going, that, that he's writing down. Those things which have taken place, those things which are taking place, and then he says in verse 19, therefore write the thing, well, that's what he says the whole thing. Therefore write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. This is where we are now in the section. We saw the things that, that were, he, he, the vision. We saw the things that are, that's the letters to the seven churches. We've seen that. And now we're moving into the aspect of the things which shall come after these things. And so just so we're clear, that's where we are. Now, remember that we were talking in terms of this book that John is, is peering in at different sections caught up in these visions. And so we're likening them to uh, Scrooge in some sense where he was able to travel uh, and see Ghost of Christmas Past goes to Christmas present and goes to Christmas future. And, and so if you remember that movie, we would he would kind of see different things that happened in the past and the present and the future. And that's kind of what John is doing here. And so I think it's important that we see it because it seems that our present generation wants to see these things as some sort of a timeline. So we're trying to read things into it as though it's some chronological reading, but but it's not that. And so what we're doing is just as John pulls the curtains back to let us see into what he's seeing, we just want to know what he sees and what he sees and then what do we learn from it, okay? So that's where we're going. That's what we're doing. And so, uh, man, I'm, I'm excited about, about where we are in this thing. So, uh, it, you know, the other thing I like, I like the fact that we're reading this there's something different about reading a book and watching a movie, right? When you read a book, your mind already pictures in your own head. Your own imagination goes to work. When it's a movie, they already did all that for you, and so it's not near as fun in my mind. And so I'm grateful there's no real-time movie about I mean, maybe there is, and I've not seen it. But, uh, but this is John's vision, and so you're going to see it potentially differently than I will, like this door that he sees in heaven. I don't know how you see that, but there's a door in heaven, and we're going to look at that. And so we're going to read this today, and, um, and he's going to write about what he sees, and he's going to write about what he hears. And so let's just kind of go with me as we do this. I'm going to read it, uh, and we'll make some running commentary like we have been. This is different than like going through a, the book of Ephesians or something where there's it's didactic and you're teaching things. This is more narrative, almost like going through the Gospels. We're listening to a story, and so um, it's not like there's principles that we just pull out of it uh, because he gives those to us. We're seeing something, and then we're interpreting that something. And so our, if we're clear on that, and I'm ready to jump into it. So here's where he says. So he's just finished writing to all of the seven churches because that's what Jesus told him to do. So we know that he wrote, potentially, according to a lot of, of uh, scholars, he wrote seven exact ones. It wasn't like they passed it around. He wrote seven Apparently those uh, seven pastors came and met with him and he handed them to them and they took them back to their churches and they began to read those things. And so to some, he had good things to say with some negative in. There was repentance that should happen in all but two of them. All of them, if they overcame, there were certain things. We know that there were some churches had lots of, of unbelievers in the midst of it and a few believers. We had others who had a good portion of believers and some unbelievers mixed in, right? And so we know all of those things that took place. That's that was the things that uh, that are. So now we're shifting gear in chapter four. This is what he says. After this, right? Well, after what? After he wrote those letters, and he began to send them out. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. It's the first thing we see. He's caught up into this heaven, and he sees this door, and it's open. Now, 
I, I don't know if you just see a door and you can already see around it like it's some prop that's there or, or if you see these huge gates, whatever it is. I don't know. That's your world. I'm just telling you. He sees a door in heaven and it's standing open. And the voice I heard first, I first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said. Now, you remember in chapter one, he got a vision that was handed down uh, by uh God to Jesus, Jesus to an angel, and the angel came and spoke. And that's this angel that gave him that message had this voice of a trumpet. And so he hears this. So that was one vision. Now it's another one. Now, there's a door in heaven, and he sees it, and it's open. That means he can see what's going on inside there. And then it says, then there's a voice, and it says this. And the voice I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this. And so he's, whether he's still on earth and he's seeing that door in heaven like a cloud that, you know, it's like there it is. And he hears the voice. All of a sudden now he's caught up. Now he's left this earth in that sense, whether physically or just in the spirit. Now he's in this vision, right? And so that's, this isn't a dream. A dream is different than a vision. Dreams, you're normally asleep. Daniel was asleep when he had a dream. Visions are more you're wide awake when this is going on, and so this is what this is. And it says, At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. So this is what we see. She's come up here, and I'm going to show you. And immediately he's caught up, and there's this throne standing in heaven. On that throne, he says, there's someone sitting, and he tells us what it is, right? He says, and we know who it is. It's God in heaven, right? And the appearance of one there sat, had the appearance of Jasper, Cornelian, a rainbow resembling um, an emerald encircled the throne. And so historically through the scriptures, rainbow means like a promise of a covenant, right? There's a covenant. And so we, we get this picture that there's this throne standing there. On that throne is one that looks like, like jewels. Now, Ezekiel will mention it like that. So many of the, of the prophets, and I mean, we could spend literally like weeks just looking at all of these things. All of these, all of these emeralds also represent some of the 12 sons of, of Jacob, the 12 tribes. You'll see that mentioned throughout the scriptures. And so we're, we're left to just understand that here, if we were to picture all that together, uh, we, we see this God who is a covenant-keeping God because of that rainbow and, and that he has these, uh, th these jewels. Like they just, man, when you, when you get jewels and you shine them just right and all the, the prism and the facet, it's just this, he's trying to describe the undescribable and he's using it in these forms that we understand. And so, so whatever it is, it's this, um, it's this bright, uh, glorious colors of, of a prism type thing. And, and so this is, this is what's sitting there. And he says, surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. Now, man, we're like, okay, what do we got here? All right. So we see a throne and then we see other thrones encircled and there's 24 elders. Now, the easiest assumption to make is that, well, 12 of those are going to be the 12 tribes of Israel and 12 of those are the apostles. The scriptures don't say that anywhere. And so we, we, and you hear a lot of people that are going to make that assumption. I'm telling you, it's not here. We just know there are 12 elders. There's leaders in the church. Let's read and see what it says. Um, 24 elders. Now, they, they had the elders in the Old Testament. They had the elders in the New Testament. Maybe it's the apostles. Maybe it is the, 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 uh, the, the tribes. But for the most part, we have to understand this. They are believers. They were dressed in white. Every time you see a, someone dressed in white, that means that they have been, uh, though their, uh, their sins be as scarlet, they are as white as snow. It is a tr transformation is taking place. Somebody has white garments, it's because Christ gave them to them. No one has white garments unless they were given to you by Christ. It's just Check it out. Go all through the scriptures and you're going to see that. So we have to assume at least these 24 are those who have been bought and purchased by the blood of Christ. Okay? And that's, that's as certain as we can be about that. 
And it says this, they were dressed in white and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. Man, if we could have this 3D image of that and that thunder, and you can, you can hear those things playing, just get this picture. He enters through that door by virtue of this vision, and he sees a throne standing, and he sees this, this uh, bejeweled type uh, individual that later we'll understand is God himself. And there will be encircled around that. So there's activity going on in heaven. This is what you need to understand. There's, there's, there's 24 elders on that. They're dressed in white. Uh, they have crowns on their head. And now from that throne, it sounds like this massive thunderstorm is going on, right? This is, this is what he says. Flashes of lightning. So you, you know, so this jewel thing is just like these flashes are, are coming out of it. Remember when you were a kid, it seemed like we used to have lightning storms that were, uh, that were brighter. I'm old. But I remember we used to have we used to have to sit in the hall uh, because of lightning storms, and I like I didn't understand why and mom wouldn't let us sit close to the window, you know, and all that kind of thing. But but man, have you ever seen, been that when it's just all of a sudden it's just like and it's, you, you can't even see anymore. It's like somebody just it's pitch dark. Somebody put a flashlight in your face, and now you're just you're done. That that's what this picture is here. And and so there's lightning, there's rumblings, there's peals of thunder. Before the throne, there's seven lamps were blazing. And these are the seven spirits of God. And so, so this is this whole picture of what's going on. Now, we've already seen the seven spirits of God. That does not mean that there are seven separate spirits of God. It means that they, that they are all encompassed in, in the spirit of God himself. Isaiah helps us make that plain. In Isaiah chapter 11, he explains to us what, what that is. And they are the facets of the spirit himself, right? They are um, the sevenfold spirit. You know how people would talk about a fivefold ministry? This is the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. This is what he does. He is Lord, right? He represents, he is the unseen. Jesus is the seen Lord in the form of Jesus Christ. The Spirit is the unseen. He's the one who dwells within us. He is the one who never leaves us or forsakes us. It's how the Trinity gets enmeshed, right? While they're three and separate, sometimes you, you can't distinguish because they are the same in that sense. And this spirit is full of wisdom and understanding. These are the sevenfold. He's Lord, he's wisdom, he's understanding, he's counsel, he's strength, he's knowledge, and he produces a fear of the Lord. And so there is this sevenfold uh, spirit in, 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 this, in this room as well. These are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. So you get this played out, and there's this throne, and there's this rainbow over it, and this, these flashes of light are coming out of that throne, and there are 24 other thrones around them, and those people sitting on them have these white robes, and they've got crowns on their heads. But in between them and, and the throne is just like this sea of glass. Are we getting this picture? I don't know what's going on in your head, but i got some crazy stuff going on in mine. Now, this is where it gets a little weird. This is where it all of a sudden it's like, man, what did I eat? I ate some bad pizza. In the center around the throne were four living creatures. And they were covered with eyes in front and in back. And so now, now we're going to know, if we dig a little deeper, we'll know that these are angelic beings. They're, they're, they're not to be specific and, and, and drill down into that, but they're cherubim and they're seraphim, right? And there's, there's archangels, there's different ones. These seraphim, have eyes all around. They don't miss a thing. Now, if you remember in your studies of, of uh, Elijah, there was a wheel within a wheel, and it had eyes as well, and that, the, the, all of those things. There's, there's something about this. It's like the all-seeing thing going on. And so you have these four creatures. Uh, we're going to call them seraphim because that's how they would traditionally be understood. And they have six wings, and they have eyes uh, all the way around them. Now, listen to how he describes them. Four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. So, so here's this angelic being because it's. We're going to learn later they had six wings, but and the, the eyes are everywhere. So it's like, what in the world am I looking at? Um, man, yesterday, side note, Tammy and I were looking at BBC. I don't know what was it, Planet Planet Earth. Planet Earth. Uh, I get tired of man. I'm old. I'm sitting here. And I can't move. And it's Saturday, and it's rainy, and so. I, I we saw some things on that show, some creatures that looked like, I mean, they were insane. I'm like, it, they were weird. And you think only God could do something 
like that, right? That like like the carpenter termite and then some of these other termites. And when they expand them and you see these things, my mind is just like blown away. And some of these things that look like little, uh, you know, what do you call those things? Yeah, only they're like about the size of that sofa. I'm like, that looks like the dinosaur thing. But but they're out there in the desert. And then you see these, um, uh, the, the lions trying to grab the little rats and mice that are out there and just to watch them jump. And the ravens who were trying to uh, be pretty and, and fluffy and who could jump the highest we'd get the best we'd be, get the best other bird it was the, I don't know why I'm ranting right now but it was crazy and so when you I see all of that there's so much creation that we've never seen and then you look at this and you go man in heaven it's even more bizarre and so here's this angel and one of them the face is like a lion but their eyes all around it I don't even know how to I wouldn't even know how to draw that but that's what's going on and he says this the second was like an ox the third had a face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under the wings, day and night. They never stopped saying. Now, we're going to read that. So you got, I mean, every time they open their wings, there's like more eyeballs. Like, you, they're everywhere. Now, what's interesting is, and this is kind of historical. You don't find it necessarily in the scriptures, but... You know, the lion, some would say, represents nobility, and others would say it represents strength. The ox represents strength or service because they are the service animal. They're the ones who, who we use. And so th these are ways of depicting that. Man is always seen as having the ability to reason, which the animal kingdom doesn't. They're more instinctive, but we can reason. We, we, we have wisdom. Uh, and then the uh, eagle is that speed or swift of flight. And so whatever that means, that's what's going on there. Now, listen to what it says they're constantly saying. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So now, John is there. He's, he's made himself, he, he saw the door in the cloud. He made himself there. He peers in. He sees this throne standing there and on it is this bejeweled creature with flashes of lightning coming out which we know to be God and 12 I'm repetitive but I want us to get it 24 uh, thrones garments of white crowns on their heads the sea of glass in between them a rainbow around that throne that signifies a covenant keeping God with these people and then you've got these four creatures eyes everywhere six wings a lion an ox a man and an eagle and and he now and he hears this one. He's got a man sounding like a trumpet explaining things to him, and then he's hearing this from those from those four creatures: "Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come." Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the, so every time they utter that, the the elders sitting on those thrones they just fall to the floor. That's what it says. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and they have being. Now, wow. That, that's a scene. What, what are we learning from that? Right? What do you see going on there? Isn't that right? Now, here's what I want us to understand. That's happening right now. Those are the things that are to come. And we know when John saw it, it was there. So here's what I want us to understand. There, there's this world that you and I live in and we see, right? And then there's another world in heaven that we don't see. But we need to know is there. We need to know that there is a God of all creation. And it says here, he created all things. And by your will, they were created and they have their being. That every one of us are here because that one who sits on that throne in heaven called it into existence. And they're in that heaven right now today a throne and a rainbow over it and a sea of glass. This isn't just some made up thing. This is what's happening. This is what he's seeing. And there's worship going on in heaven constantly. 
just file that away because we're going to come back to that in a minute. I just want to see some things. Now, so he says in chapter 5, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll, but no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. All right, so now, now he's seeing something different. Now he's the, 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 the bejeweled God himself sitting on that throne with flashing and rumbling and peeling has in his right hand a scroll written on both sides, seven seals in it, and he's holding it. Now, you and me know that this is the unfolding of those things to come, right? And so if it's, if it's in real time, this is, this is what's mind-blowing. It should be mind-blowing to you. I'm not stretching anything. As those things are unfolding, we are seeing events that are beginning to take place. At some point in those events, I show up. Now, it's not written in there, but because I'm a part of those things that are to come, I'm in there. You're in there. I'm not making much of this, but understand this. This is the scroll. This is God's plan being unfolded as, as, it's, as it's unfurled. Now, we're going to see it next week. And we're going to see four horses and, and, and riders on these horses. And we're going to see things to come. And we're going to see a big picture of what it looks like for this fallen world to, to have these four. These aren't good. These aren't good riders. These are... These are bringing devastation because it's what sin does. We're going to see that next week. But for right now, I want us to understand that this scroll is what it was already written before any there was a there was a word spoken. Right? We know that. I, I, I was formed in God's mind before I was yet conceived with my mom and dad. And so there's nothing that escapes his notice. Acts 17, 26, God appoints the exact times and places in which we find ourselves and the boundaries in which sustains us, right? These are things that you and me need. That this, this is, I want you to hear this as comfort because I want you to understand that what seems like chaos here is already played out in God's mind. Now, I've shared this illustration with you before and I'm going to do it again because this is what I see as we begin to look at this unfold. If I were to stand at the top of the Grand Canyon and look out into that river that flows through there, and, and they have those rafting tours, you can see from that vantage point, you can see when people look little ants, but they jump into a boat, and you can see them getting in, but you can see about midway people on those rafts, and you can look over that way, and you can see them getting out of those rafts, right? It's all real time for God. This is For us, that's what it looks like at the Grand Canyon, that's what it looks like from God and his throne advantage. He's seeing us in real time. He's already seen my beginning and he's already seen my end. That's why there's, there's comfort here. I'm hoping we're hearing comfort. I don't want to, I'm not just trying to just confuse us with anything, but there should be comfort in knowing that, that, that there, is, there is this thing happening in the heaven and we're going to see it unfold, but not to freak us out. Because we already know how the end plays out. We're just going to see that it does unfold. Right? And so uh, when Jesus, they asked Jesus, hey, teach us how to pray. Part of his prayer was that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God's will is always done in heaven. God's will is going to be done on earth. But there's a whole lot of mischief that goes on because fallen man and the stupidity of man is creating all sorts of mischief. That's what the four horsemen are about next week. We'll see that as it plays out. Let's get back to this. He says, who is worthy to open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. And I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look inside. And John is like, man, I, I want to know what's going on. But he's like, there, there's, there's no one there. And then there's this voice. Then one of the elders said to me, Hey, don't weep. See the lion? Right? Now, all of a sudden, we're adding another to this. Listen to what he says. See the lion of the tribe of Judah? 
So now John is seeing something he hadn't heretofore seen. And we know that. Lion of the tribe of Judah. We know who that is. That's Jesus, right? The root of David. He's triumphed. So now all of a sudden you see this. Now, he says it's the lion of the tribe of Judah, but what shows up is a, is a lamb. So let's just see it. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. This is the one who has authority to give life and to let it play out. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures. Now, all of a sudden, it's meshed together. Almighty God Most High is on that throne, but now transposed into that is a lamb that looks like it was slain that is on that throne too. See, this is the trinity that you can't, we can't put our hands around it, but though they're separate, they're, they're mingled together on occasion. So, so much so that they say, let us make man in our own image, right? They can say things like that because it's together this thing is done. And then it says this, he had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits. All of a sudden, we've added the Holy Spirit into that mix as well now, right? So it's, it's this bejeweled God Most High, a, a lamb that was slain, which is Christ, and then the seven spirits uh, in, on top of that, which are the, the, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And it says this, um, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they're holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Catch this real time, okay? You and me are going to pray in a minute. You probably already prayed this morning and we do that. When we pray, bowl in heaven that is the incense and the aroma of God's kingdom in heaven, that kingdom there, and it is your prayers and my prayers. Do we hear that? Do we know that he also says that he all of our tears he, he, he catches in a bottle? This is the God of all creation sitting on a throne in real time, the most real of real. This is, this is not the realness of real. The realness of real is what's happening up there. And up there, those tears that John is crying, the prophet said he catches them in a, in, 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 in a bottle uh, so that he can house them there. And that that bowl of incense is the prayer. So it's almost like every time we pray, man, that bowl is just is just more, more fuel is added to that so that the incense and the aroma of that goes crazy. This is what's happening here. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain with your blood, you purchased men of God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. That's you and me. I don't know if you know that or not. But if you've repented of your sins and cried out to him, that is you, right? Though you, you blood, he, he was sealed with your blood, which you purchased men for God. You were purchased by the blood of Christ. So he's speaking of you in that throne room up there. And, and where are we from? Every tribe, language, people, nation. And he's made us a kingdom. That's why when Paul writes about we're, we're, we're this building being formed together, right? Uh, housing the, the fullness of the living God. This is what he's speaking of. We are part of the kingdom of God. It's not an earthly kingdom at this point, but it will be. But it is a heavenly. It is a it is a, a, a spiritual kingdom. And you and me are a part of that. This is what he's saying is played out here. And he says this, you have made them a kingdom and priests to serve our God. Now, you realize, too, we, a priest was one who had access to whatever God that was being worshipped at the time. And in God's economy, it was the Levites that were the priests. They had access to God. When Christ became the once-for-all sacrifice and that veil was torn in two, it meant no longer did people have to stand on this side and there was a veil on the other and a holy one would come in uh, and, and commune with God and speak on our behalf that that whole thing is gone. So now we are a kingdom and we're priests. 
I have complete access to that very throne room that John is seeing. I have access to. I should come. This is why the writer of the Hebrews says, let us come boldly before the throne of Christ. Why? Because we have access. I don't, I don't need to, I don't, I don't need to go to a priest. I don't need to go to you. I get straight to God. This is, you, you catch all, I want us to see how we get enmeshed in this vision that he's got here. And then it says this, then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10. Now all of a sudden we've added one more layer in this vision. We had the four creatures. We had the 24 elders. We had the voice of the trumpet that was speaking to John. We had John. We had the lamb. We had the, the, the uh, seven spirits. We have God most high. And all of a sudden an angelic host shows up. Myriads among myriads. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them. All of a sudden now John is like, he's seeing layers upon layers. And so listen to what he just said. Every creature in heaven, like all of those there, I don't know if he means and there's more beyond that, but all of the creatures in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them. So all of a sudden now, every created thing in heaven, I mean, in, in the world is doing this, singing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. Man, I can't wait for next week. But let's just talk a little bit about that. Because here's where I want us to make the connection. There's a lot of junk going on right now. It's that throne room in heaven where God Most High dwells, that centers everything. If we fail, I don't know if your world's like mine. I, I'm a recovering control freak, right? Are you? Aren't we most of us like that? I want to fix everything, right? I want to fix it so my friend doesn't go to jail. I want to fix it so that, I mean, I'm, we're that way. And, and sometimes our fix is stupid, isn't it? How many times you tried to fix a relationship by telling people how it is instead of just being unmoved by people, right? And so in that throne room, which is real reality, he's in charge. It's all being played out. Each one of those scrolls opens up. It's like we're seeing history lived out, right? It, it looks like future, but it's all in God's mind, it's already been lived out. Now, don't let this wig your theology out, but this was in the mind of God, my stupidity and everything else, uh, but before it happened. It didn't catch God off guard. He go, oh man, let me go to plan B. No, no, he causes all things to work together. So knowing that these were the components that he didn't cause the things to happen, but as they happened because of my sin and somebody else's sin and the sin principle and just life, I'm centered not, not, not by my circumstances, but by the God who's above my circumstances. This is, this is what causes us to be at peace, to not be anxious, to not worry. This is, it gets no deeper than this. You can worry if you want to. You can be stressed out if you want to. But there's a God in heaven who's already seen everything played out. And if we go all the way to the end, no matter how difficult it was. Because some of these people that we read in here, they, they die terrible deaths. But their end is good. We, we, we're, we're living as though this is all there is. And I just want us to see this right now. That I'm going to let him be on that throne up there. And I'm going to quit trying to climb onto the throne. There was a little book when I was, Christ Heart My Home. And it had to do with Back then, it was like carnal Christian and all that. Who's on the throne of your life? Either you're going to be on there or he's going to be on there, but you both can't be on there. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And so you would see that 
played out. If he is that powerful in heaven, and in his right hand he has a scroll that has laid out everything that is to come, it, as scary as that may be, I breathe easier because I know he, he's in charge. It ends well. I don't know if you find encouragement in that, but I do. And I like teaching this book like this better than I do trying to determine what, what's going to happen next and, and what is, is, who's the Antichrist. And we're going we're gonna to have those conversations. Next week, we're going to look at that because the first rider is the Antichrist. But we'll, that's, that's for next week. This week, I just want us to understand that, listen, it's okay that life is as crazy as it is here. The true reality is it's already been played out and there's a king in heaven. And there's God most high on the throne. And he neither sleeps nor slumbers. So I'm going to let him do his thing, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust him. That's the message I find in this book of the Revelation. So I'm glad you came by and let me share it with you. Let's sing. <laughs>